Continuing anger on the streets of Cairo after an Egyptian court sentences 12 students to 17 years in prison each for taking part in protests. Human rights groups have called the verdict harsh. What's behind the sentence and could it stop others from protesting? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Jane Dutton. Selective justice is no justice at all. That is the message from human rights groups who are increasingly critical of Egypt's interim government. Thousands of people have been arrested and hundreds killed since Mohamed Morsi was deposed in July. Many people have been treated unfairly, including in military tribunals. The latest case to attract criticism, 12 students who've been jailed for 17 years each. They were arrested for taking part in protests in October that resulted in an attack inside the Al-Azhar University in Cairo. The verdict has been described as unfairly harsh. Egypt's interim government has grown more intolerant of dissent since Mohamed Morsi was deposed. Thousands of his supporters have been arrested or detained in the last few months. A number of people have been tried under military tribunals, including three journalists. Critics say the government has failed to investigate the deaths of protesters or hold perpetrators accountable. Syrian refugees have been forced to return home and at least 1,500 Syrians are being held indefinitely in Egyptian jails. And the fairness of Mohamed Morsi's trial has been called into question. Lawyers were barred from seeing Morsi before the trial began and only given access to important documents at the last minute. So let's bring in our guests from London, Nicholas Piershord, campaigner for the North Africa team at Amnesty International. From Washington, D.C., Tarek Radwan, Associate Director for Research at the Atlantic Council's Rafik Hariri Center. And joining us on Skype from Cairo is Hisham Kassam, journalist and democracy activist. Gentlemen, welcome. But let's uh, first start with Yusuf Salahin. He's a member of the Students' Union at Al-Azhar University. He joins us on the line from Cairo. Yusuf, I believe you are in the middle of a demonstration, so thanks very much for taking the time to talk to us. Tell us about what you know about the sentences imposed on the students. Some of them are your friends. Yeah. Um Actually, one of my friends, uh, Mohamed Merebi, is, uh, is uh, my colleague. Uh, in, they accused him of violent photography. I, I've never um, heard of uh, this uh, term before, violent photography. I don't know uh, like if his trash was demolishing the building or what. Um, and, and he got he 17 years for that? 17 years and 64,000 Egyptian pounds. Um, I don't know how could they, like, judge up a peaceful student who was, who was just spreading his opinion um, with such a, an unjust um, judge verdict. And what do you think the message is to you and your fellow students? Yeah, exactly. The um, military school and government is sending us a clear uh, message that they are trying to scare us and stop us from demonstrating and protesting. Uh, which, which we're not going to do, we're not going to stop, never. So it's not um, going to scare you off, but what do you make about the new law which will give police the power to ban demonstrations outright? How then will you vent your anger? Um, I'm telling you something. We, we believe that the coup is not and void, and whatsoever is built on it, any, any law, anything, any person who is appointed by the coup government, is, is, we, we just... It's not We don't care about it. We're going to continue protesting and asking for our rights and asking for our um, regime that we elected the majority of the Egyptian people have elected. Tell us about your thoughts when you heard about Mohamed Morsi and his first statement on Wednesday and the fact that he said there would be no security until the coup is reversed. Tell us what sort of support he has and how did it make you feel? Hearing that, um, um, he's, he's, he's supporting us as we are uh, supporting him. Um, like, I, I, I think he's, he's doing the right thing, and it's, um, it's encouraging us to keep going um, along the way. 
But to keep going for what? There certainly seems absolutely no appetite to bring Mohamed Mercy back at any stage. So what is it that you are fighting for? We're fighting for many things, sir. We, we have, um, we, we, want, we want justice and freedom. Justice for those uh, who have committed lots of crimes. And among them, as a, especially as a, as a as her student, is um, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar. We don't call him in, uh, Grand Imam anymore. We call him the Grand Imam of the coup. And the president of the university, they, they were main leaders of the coup. Um, and they were re a main reason for killing hundreds or thousands of innocent people. Uh, you know, in, uh, on, on the top of roofs of the Al-Azhar building, there were snipers who were, who were killing people in Rabah, uh, which is... Uh, and also to release all uh, people in, in prison and jail. Um, now, so you're talking about, I'm just going to interject here very quickly, you're talking about the uh, the killing in Rabah Square, um, around the, sorry, Rabah Mosque, and it's been all cleared up. Any evidence of those horrific days have been removed. Will this wipe out the memory for you in any way? No. The history will write this down. This is going to be history, and people all over the world will know that the military leader, uh, leaders and, um, and um, leaders of the coup, all of them, the Grand Imam of Azhar and whosoever participated in this, are all like equal criminals, like war criminals, all of them. Okay, Yusuf Salafin, thank you very much. Let's leave it there. I really appreciate you telling us about your thoughts and your plans. Hisham Qasim, let me come to you now. I mean, Yusuf, obviously quite emotional, but what happened to to his friends. I mean, what are people in Cairo saying about the sentencing, the fact that it's seen as being so harsh and what it ultimately means? Well, it's sad. Clearly, a 17-year uh, sentence on any student is harsh. But again, when we look at it, Egypt now has entered this situation where a supremacist religious cult, like the Muslim Brotherhood, are willing to use their supporters like cannon fodder. And they're more than happy to push them into acts where things might uh, have like legal, photography. Consequences, legal consequences, such as those. Or in, in other cases worse, we see the Mohammed Morsi statement which he made yesterday talking about how the pure blood of the martyrs is going to pave the way forward. And that, that is almost incitement, and it shows that the man is completely detached from reality and does not realize that those 15 million that came out in the street, had it not been for the military, he would have never been detained. He would have been uh, summarily executed on the street. It was going to be a Ceausescu scenario. Instead of him being the ex-president now, which he's refusing, he would have simply been the late president. So it breaks my heart to see sentences like that uh, happening. But again, this is not a normal situation. We're facing, like I said, a supremacist religious cult that is willing to do any, as much damage to their supporters as they are in order to get uh, their way politically. Tarek, what do you make of Hisham's comments? I mean, do you think that's what's happening at the moment? Well, I can certainly appreciate where Hashem is coming from. I mean, there, are, there has been a lot of anger against the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Muslim Brotherhood itself has obviously, I mean, through Morsi's statements uh, and, and so on, has made clear that there's going to be no compromise uh, until Morsi comes to power, which really, I mean, it seems delusional, uh, but I don't think that the Brotherhood is stupid enough to think that, you know, Morsi will ever be reinstated. Uh, I mean, this is what I like to call a thorn in the side tactics. I mean, the, the Brotherhood is using what few tools remains at its disposal to perhaps eventually come to a deal with the, with the, the interim government and the military. Uh, but sadly, what we're seeing is, you know, the human rights, uh, such, a, you know, uh, such as due process uh, in the case of this, uh, this sentencing, um, is really uh, the casualty of of this binary war between the military and the brotherhood and sadly it's squeezing out the uh, the any any sort of political space for uh, a constructive conversation Nicholas what do you make of all of this that's happening the the sentencing the 
the words by Mohamed Mursi in a human rights point of view? Well, I think this case sums up everything that's wrong with the human rights situation in Egypt today, actually. It took prosecutors just less than two weeks to close the file on these students, but it's taken them more than three months to deliver accountability for the protester killings at Rabah al Dawiya. Prosecutor investigations so far have held just a handful of security forces uh, for investigation into using excessive force against protesters. I think unless we see some real moves towards truth and justice soon, it's looking increasingly like it's uh, one law for supporters of Mohamed Morsi. Well, how, and how one is law it possible? Is it possible that you're going to get any more information from what the government was involved in, what the forces were involved in? Well, I think that depends on the political will. We really need to see independent and impartial investigations. The problem is, like we saw with the trial of Mohamed Morsi, there are serious concerns over whether the prosecution can deliver that. Lawyers for Mohamed Morsi told us that they have been denied key defense documents and the right to see the defendant before the trial. I think the uh, real test is to come. We need to see whether Mohamed Morsi will get a truly fair trial. Hisham, is there a feeling in Egypt that Mohamed Mursi and the Muslim Brotherhood members who are all facing trial towards the end of this year next year will get a fair trial, considering that the paperwork has been held back and, and uh, what Nicholas laid out there? I might agree with Nicholas and the point that the lawyers did not have access to Mohamed Mursi before the trial. Uh, however, on the, the first session, I think the judge managed to get the procedure in order. And then as we progress, we will observe. And like Mubarak, whom I opposed for 20 years but insisted on a fair trial for, Morsi must get the same. Again, there's been quite a lot of arrests, but no detention. Uh, the charges have been made against uh, the members of the Brotherhood. And, and, and in this verbal war that's going on, it's difficult to assess how much due process is being observed. I hope that we, as we progress, due process will be observed by the prosecutor general and the courts and the judiciary in Egypt. And if it works in the other direction, people like myself will be standing there and insisting on fair trials for the Mohammed Morsi and his supporters. Oh, really? Because, I mean, the media has been accused of, of stepping back in calling for the government to investigate itself. I mean, what role for the media now and, and why aren't you putting on more pressure? Uh, well, look, to begin with, I don't expect much to happen from the media because on one hand we've had the Islamist media that was shut down, the, the TV stations, uh, charged with incitement and uh, what I take against the government is that investigations have not taken place so far, although I'm pretty positive that incitement... Considering that the media is all supportive of the government at the moment? No, it's not supportive of the government. The media is anti-Morsi. These main stations that are being watched by most of the Egyptians fell out with Morsi before he was ousted from power. So it, it goes back some time now. Uh, and the, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there are no directives coming from the government to the media to, to take a position against Morsi and the Brotherhood, but it's a position they've taken prior and while it's not um, unbiased but there is no pressure upon them to take this position. Tarek it seemed that you wanted to say something about the media and its role at the moment. Well I think really sadly in Egypt it's extremely difficult for any objective voice in the media to, uh, to actually come forward. I mean, in this hyper-nationalist climate that we have, uh, there is simply no room for these middle-of-the-road voices. Uh, this false binary that's been presented to the Egyptian people is, you're either with us or you're against us. Uh, and, and so if you speak against the, the interim government, uh, you're a Brotherhood supporter or a fifth columnist. I mean, it seems uh, that freedom of speech speak... is effectively gone, isn't it? 
it's it's really it's coming under tremendous pressure and the sad thing is that it's not simply the interim government that's putting that pressure it's actually the general public there is no appetite for any sort of sympathy towards uh, President Morsi or the Muslim Brotherhood now that's not to say that the the Muslim Brotherhood or Morsi are not guilty I mean the crimes that have been committed are real there are serious accountability issues here that need to be addressed but that the same is also true of the security forces I mean we're seeing more and more of this return to the practice of torture and harassment arbitrary arrest and detention uh, this is going back to a very bad uh, uh, you know process uh, that that we experienced under Mubarak and and you know frankly we already know uh, we've seen that this is not a sustainable tactic now, Mohamed Mursi says that he was kidnapped by the military but remains Egypt's president. His first statement seems to have angered the country's rulers who moved him into solitary confinement on Thursday. Mursi called on all Egyptians to stand up firm, realizing this coup is a crime, an act of treason. He also paid tribute to what he called the martyrs and victims of ongoing attacks and clashes throughout the country since the coup. Nicholas, are you worried about him being in solitary confinement? I think we're worried about how all of Mohamed Morsi's supporters and Mohamed Morsi are being treated in detention. We've documented dozens of cases where, well, I mean, as I say, we've documented dozens of cases where due process rights were violated. People were held without being brought before a lawyer. They were uh, tried in prison cases. In some cases, judges have even stepped down, refusing to try because of unfair trial concerns. As for Mohamed Morsi, like I say, you know, time will tell. Time will tell whether he gets a fair trial. This is the key test for Egypt now, whether they will be able to deliver a fair trial for Mohamed Morsi. You were talking a little earlier on about the human rights abuses that you are seeing across the country, and there's uh, so much happening at the moment. We've seen military trials against journalists. We've seen a dramatic increase in crimes against women. Why is all this happening? Well, I think there's a key question here, and that's whether Egypt really has rule of law, and that's something that Mohamed Morsi was never able to deliver, and that's something that the interim authorities seem to have failed to deliver. What we see is one law for the security forces and one law for ordinary Egyptians, like Coptic Christians and uh, women protesters. I think the Egyptian authorities need to take a good, hard look at how the security forces have failed to protect women and Coptic Christians over the last few weeks and months and uh, they really need to make the reforms needed to bring the security forces in line with international law and standards. Until they, they do that, the security forces will just remain a jackhammer to be used against uh, Egypt's political opposition, uh, including supporters of Mohamed Morsi. Hisham, what are women in Egypt telling you about the situation on the street? I mean, a, a poll was recently conducted by a group of gender experts. They say Egypt is the worst Arab country to be a woman in the sense of harassment, sexual harassment? Is that your question? Yes, in the way uh, repression and, and sexual harassment. No, well, that, well, that's one thing and that's the other. Sexual harassment, it's terrible. It's, yes, truly one of the worst places and this is an issue that has to be addressed, but not simply by the authorities. It's a wider issue where uh, political forces, activists from all walks uh, ha have to get involved and uh, put an end to that. But I'm not aware of any action that was taken specifically against women demonstrators or demonstrating for the cause of women. Tarek, what are you hearing about this as well as the, the national fervor that's sweeping the country in some groups, uh, which, is, which is playing out on refugees, the fact that Syrian refugees, for example, are being rounded up and put into jails. What's going on there? Well, as far as uh, women are concerned, I absolutely agree with Hisham uh, that, you know, there, there is uh, this long, uh, long running harassment of women and, uh, and minorities in general. And with, in particular, with regard to uh, Syrians, um, I, I think this is really a backlash against the position that uh, Morsi had taken. I mean, there's, uh, there's the, his infamous uh, uh, appearance at, uh, you know, a, a conference and, and uh, where he stood by as, as uh, you know, a Salafi preacher.
preachers uh, advocated for martyrdom and and to go off and fight in jihad and so forth. Um, uh, there, this is really I, th I think is just a blowback. Uh, and sadly, Syrian refugees are being caught in this crossfire, uh, and as a result, they've been rounded up, detained, and uh, forced to return to extremely difficult conditions. Uh, you know, we've seen the incessant bombardment by uh, Assad forces of, of Syrian territories, and this is uh, certainly uh, contrary to international law and, and standards. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I think it's an extremely dangerous situation, but it's a direct result of the kind of political polarization in Egypt that we're seeing today. Hisham, let's go back to how the government is clamping down on the Muslim Brotherhood and anybody who was against uh, the coup. At the same time, they're talking about a roadmap and the constitution. Where does this leave the Freedom and Justice Party? That's the political wing of the Muslim Brotherhood, considering so many of the Muslim Brotherhood leaders are in jail. Well, of course, I differ with your overgeneralization about the crackdown on Muslim Brotherhood and anybody who's supporting them. And the word coup, I, you know, I don't uh, believe that it was a coup. I believe there was no option but for the military to intervene. Otherwise, we would have had a serious bloodbath. And I recognize the massacre that took place well, in Rabah. they taken it to the polls. No, 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 no. These 15 million people out in the street, or as Tony Blair estimated, 17 million, were not going to wait for the polls. There had to be an intervention. Morsi was given a one-week um, ultimatum for a political solution. It was extended by another 48 hours, and he insisted on ignoring it because he was not a president, but a representative of a supremacist religious cult, like I said. Okay, so, let's not go uh, into the debate about a coup because I realize it's still a very sensitive issue for many no, people no, sure. in Egypt. But uh, let's talk about that roadmap quickly and where yeah. this leaves the Freedom and Justice Party. And where it leaves the Freedom and Justice Party is up to them. If they want to come back on the table as the Freedom and Justice Party, they are most welcome. But if they insist on coming back as the Muslim Brotherhood, no more of that. Otherwise, we're going to allow for the Christian Brotherhood, the Shia Brotherhood, and the perfect formula for sectarian strife. It must not be allowed under any circumstance. The region is now falling back into ethnic conflict. We've seen what is happening in Syria and the potential for it to, to spread. We can't allow that to happen. They come back as a political party, not as a religious supremacist group. Okay, Tariq, do you think that the hallmarks of a democratic state have all but vanished? Well, it's it's really difficult to say. I mean, if we're talking, uh, you know, democracy by definition is all about political inclusion, and at the moment, uh, that that is simply not the case. We are not having this national dialogue that is necessary. We're we're not reaching some sort of understanding with all segments of society, and and that's that's the real problem here. Uh, the roadmap, uh, as far as the constitution, parliamentary elections, presidential elections, I I, I have no doubt that the the interim government will actually fulfill these uh, these problems uh, these uh, these uh these steps, rather. Uh, but for instance, let's take the constitution drafting process. I mean, the 50-member committee is holding closed-door sessions. There, where is the, the national discussion over the articles that concern the military, that concern accountability, that concern, uh, you know, uh, oversight in general? Uh, th this, is, this is the serious deficit uh, in the roadmap. Uh, now, a lot of this will come down to actually a law and uh, a new parliament will certainly play its own role in uh, you know creating those benchmarks for you know any sort of progress towards a, a democratic country uh, however what you know who is elected and how they behave remains to be seen okay Nicholas last question and, and briefly if you will if we can go back to a human rights point of view we know that the curfew has been lifted which I'm sure will help many Egyptians who've been going through a, a really tough time what do you think needs to happen now for Egypt? How do they bring about any sort of reconciliation? Well, I, I think we need not just a roadmap to democracy, but a roadmap to the rule of law. And it's funny that on the one hand, they've lifted the state of emergency, but on the other, they're drafting a new anti-terror law that wouldn't just apply to 
militants. It would apply to supporters of Mohamed Morsi, and it would also apply to human rights organizations and journalists. I'm afraid uh, we're going to have to leave it on that note, Nicholas. I'm sorry to cut you off, Nicholas. Pierre Shaw there, Tarek Radwan and Hisham Kassam. Thank you very much for talking to us, as, as well as Yusuf Salin, who spoke to us earlier on the show. And thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want, you can send us your feedback. Just email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. I'm Jane Dutton. Thanks for watching.